Hello, and welcome to the Michael Kurtz Movie Talk, coming to you right here on my YouTube channel. My name is Michael Kurtz, I am your host today, and listen, there were a lot of fantastic movies this summer. I can count at least 20 that I watched, probably even more. Um, but I think that in terms of post-pandemic, this last summer is the first time that we've seen a lot of these really big films come out. So today, what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna rank my top 10 favorite films of the summer and also my top five least favorite films of the summer. In honor of the last day of summer, today is the 23rd of September. It's the last day of summer. So let's get right into it. First of all, what I want to go over is what classifies as a summer movie because I know that summer typically starts, technically starts on June, what is it, 18th, 20th, whatever it is. But there are a lot of fantastic movies that came up before then. So in this video, we're gonna classify a summer movie as a movie that was released between June 1st and September 22nd, which was yesterday, um, because no movies came out today. So it, it must be a feature film. It has to have been on a streaming platform, a premier streaming platform. We're talking about Disney Plus and Netflix and all sorts of good stuff. So feature film had to be in theaters or had to be on those premier streaming platforms. Now, when I talk about my favorite and least favorite movies of the year, of the summer, it's different than the best movies of the summer. Um, and, and here's why. When you are ranking films and talking about subjectivity, I think that favoritism is a big part of that subjectivity. Now, when you put, when you think of it as a favorite film, you kind of put all your other opinions of the technical aspects out the door. It doesn't matter um, how well the makeup was or how well the story was. If it's my favorite film, it's my favorite film. It doesn't matter if I like the, st the story was brilliant or terrible. It doesn't matter any anything about that. When we're talking about best films, and that does come into play. Because if we're talking about best films, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer gets it, obviously. It is the best technical film of the summer. But we're not doing best films. We're doing my personal favorite films. And I think when you're talking about best and favorite films, neither one is the correct way to rank movies. It's just the one we're doing today is favoritism. Um, if you liked a movie that I didn't like, you know that I'm happy for you that you liked that. I wish it worked for me. And if I liked a movie that you didn't like, well, it's too bad. I wish you liked it. Um, neither way is no. wrong. So we're going to get right into it, starting with some honorable mentions. These honorable mentions, I'm just going to go over really quickly, didn't make it to my top 10, and explain why they are an honorable mention really quickly. I have three honorable mentions that deserve to be in the top 10 but aren't. One of them is Talk To Me, that was distributed by A24, that was also directed by Danny and Michael Filippo. And this one is in my honorable mentions because of the great twist at the end and suspense. Never quite seen a horror movie that had a twist like that at the end. Elemental is also another one, directed by Peter Sohn, distributed by Walt Disney Pictures. This one is in my honorable mentions because it has great heart and genuine relationships that I honestly didn't expect from a Pixar movie that looked like Elemental. Another one is Gran Turismo, directed by Nia Blomkamp, distributed by Sony Pictures. This one is in my honorable mentions because of the great reproduction of racing anxiety. I am a runner, have a lot of history with racing. I thought that it re reproduced that anxiety and thrill with racing. All right, now that we've got those three films out of the way, let's start in our top 10 favorite films of summer 2023. Number 10, we're gonna start out with Blue Beetle, directed by Angel Manuel Soto, distributed by Warner Brothers. Now this film, I, I went into it not loving the trailers. I honestly thought it was going to be another mid 2000s, type of superhero movie where it was very generic. Not saying that it wasn't generic. I just thought the action might be very lackluster. It, it turns out it's it's actually adorably fun. It's a really fun time. I think it's more and more important recently that superhero films focus on the characters and story of, of those characters more than the action. I think Blue Beetle did a really great job at this. A good story is a good story no matter who tells it. I have no Mexican heritage in my family, and this story had a lot to do with Mexican heritage. I thought it was really genuine. I loved the dynamic between all the characters. I thought it was a lot of fun, had a lot of heart. Great time. It, it did turn into a little bit of a CGI fest towards the end, which is why it's not higher in my top 10 films. But nevertheless, it's a really great time. You should go out and see it with your friends. You will not be disappointed. All right, 
Going on to number nine, my top 10 favorite films, is Flamin' Hot, directed by Eva Lingoria on Disney+. Plus. Um, another Mexican heritage story that really touched my heart. It really brought the realities of Mexicans living near the border, who are illegal immigrants, to the light. I, being from Minnesota, now living in Albuquerque, I had really no idea what that might be like. I still don't. And you hear a lot of things in the news, but this really brings light to what the realities are. It's important for movies to have the audience sympathize and root for the main character, which is this movie completely did. I was always rooting for our main character, um, developing the flaming Hot Cheeto. I thought it was really well done, well made, full of heart. You should go watch this on your own time. All right, all right let's look at my number eight film of the summer of 2023. It's gonna be Strays, directed by Josh Greenbun, distributed by Universal Pictures. Now this is a comedy that did not make a lot of money at all. Um, nevertheless, I thought it was incredibly hilarious. Uh, at, at the center of the, of the film, it's a critique on how dog owners treat their dogs. <laughs> if you really like dirty humor, you will love this. I think some of the nuances will go over your head if you're not a dog owner, but it's incredibly raunchy. There's a lot of fun punchlines that I really died laughing at. If you're looking for a great belly laugh, this one's for you. All right. Let's look at my number seven uh, favorite movie of 2023, summer 2023. This one is No Hard Feelings, directed by Gene Subinski, distributed by Sony Pictures. Now, this one is high on my list, and I know for a fact it will not be high on many people's list. And this is an, one of those instances where the favorite movie comes before the best movie, at least in my ranking. This is not number seven best film, but this is number seven favorite film for me. I really connected with the main character Percy on a personal level. When I went to college, I was kind of sheltered. Um, I got introduced to drinking, sex, drugs, all that stuff. And I just, I was not prepared for being exposed to it, um, regardless of whether I part partaked in it or not, which I didn't. But I think I was definitely not sheltered to the extent Percy was, but I had, I could relate to him on that level, which I felt <laughs> was really too personal for me. The dynamic between both Percy and Jennifer Lawrence's character was great. Jennifer Lawrence was really funny. Uh, you can expect her to continue to get jobs like this. I think that if she continues to get these comedy jobs, that she can really rock them and she'll really, she can really make a career out of these comedies. It's kind of a feel-good one that I watched on a really sad day, um, but nevertheless, number seven. Number six. My number six top ten is where we start getting to the best picture nominations that I believe. Number six, we're starting out with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, of course, distributed by Sony Pictures. Now, this is one of the most original comic book movies I've ever seen in my life, in a time where there's so many comic book movies. The film loosely follows a three-act outline, but I, I really thought that it was more of a two-and-a-half-act outline, and that little half-act is the end, or I should say the beginning, of the Beyond the Spider-Verse movie, which I think will be really well. I think the story around the characters really came together because the connection between the characters actually mattered in this story. They, when they did this, this multiverse thing, they did something that I never thought they'd do in a movie ever. It's hard to kind of explain what they did, unless you've already seen it. And some people are calling this the best comic book movie ever. I don't think it's the best comic book movie ever. I'm not even sure if it's the best comic book movie this year. But um, at least for me, some of the animation didn't work for me. Kind of those pastel colors, the watercolors did not work for me when they were on the screen, which is why it's not higher. Nevertheless, really great film. You should go and see it. Everyone should go see this. Also, I think this, this movie should get a Best Picture nomination if it doesn't. We need to have a real talk with the uh, Academy about this one. All right, number five, in our top five now. Number five is the movie that took over the world. Number one box office movie of the year. It's Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig, distributed by Warner Brothers. What isn't there to say about Barbie? It is, uh, the opening of the movie might be one of the best openings I've ever seen in a movie. When it was in Barbie Land, it was absolutely flawless. Everything was so overly stupid and dumb and it worked. I was absolutely in love with Ryan Gosling's 
acting in the first part when they were in Barbie Land. I thought the, the dance number was a real highlight for me. It was cr incredibly entertaining, a lot of fun. The camera work was, I think, designed very carefully and meticulously, and it absolutely worked. Now, the story is quite clever. It's, it's not a critique on men. It's a critique on how society views women. When America Ferreira's character is going on this big rant about expectations of women, it's not, it never, she never actually mentions men. She mentions how, I guess she does mention men, but the whole rant is about how men and women and society view women unrealistically. It's not just about men, which I think was really brilliant, breaking down the gender stereotypes like that. It's not alienating men. It's really just focusing on women. And if you think that it is about men, and that's bashing men, then you are insecure <laughs> about your manliness. Go see this movie. You've already seen it. You should go see it a second time, maybe a fourth time if you've already seen it three times. All right, moving on. This one is, of course, the one that came out on the same weekend. Number two for R-rated box office movies. This one is Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan, distributed by Universal Pictures. Now, like I said earlier, Oppenheimer is by far the best film of 2023 on a technical standpoint. Uh, we all know they did the bomb for real. They have all these incredible actors with them. You should expect multiple Oscar nominations for this. We're talking Best Picture. Christopher Nolan for Best Director. Robert Downey Jr. for Best Supporting Actor. Emily Blunt for Best Supporting Actress. Four guaranteed nominations. I will eat my jeans if these four don't get nominated for these categories. I really loved how they used practical sets all throughout the, the movie. They actually went to Los Alamos. I know this because my professor lives in Los Alamos. He, he makes documentaries there. They went to Los Alamos. Super cool. Um, I, I think because uh, of the acting performances and the technical aspects, it's by far Christopher Nolan's best film, 100%. Let's talk about the story and other aspects and why it's not one of my top three favorite films. I think the movie runs about 30 minutes too long. Um, three hour movies aren't bad. Like Interstellar is my favorite movie. That's three hours long. But this one, Oppenheimer, it's, it's basically all talking. And it's not, it's not a terrible thing. It's three movies in one. But towards the end, after the second act, I kept looking at my watch. Like, okay, it's, it's only been two hours. I feel like I've been in this for two and a half, 245. There's still another hour to go. I think about 85% of the film, I was incredibly intrigued in the story. I love how Christopher Nolan set up these concepts, these ideas in the story, and then he would let them go on for a little bit, and he would always jump back to address them. They always paid off in a way, and that's what makes it really fascinating. And that was always on the edge of my seat, because you never know when these aspects over here would then jump over here, I mean, part of the story towards the end. It's also one of those movies that make you think about our place in the world where when I left, I really felt that democracy and just living on earth as it is, is incredibly fragile. It makes you think a little bit harder about how you live, where you live, and what aspects you choose to live by, what values. All right, let's move on to my top three. Top three is gonna be a little divisive because I bet you a lot of people don't have these three movies in their top three. My number three is a one that should have made more money, but didn't, didn't even break even, but nevertheless, incredible film. Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. Directed by Christopher McQuarrie, distributed by Paramount Pictures. Now, allow me to start off by saying that I've never seen a Mission Impossible movie until this one. Okay, now I'll, I'll die on the hill <laughs> that Tom Cruise is an incredible movie star. Absolutely incredible. I love watching him on screen. I think he brings that movie magic that a lot of actors don't bring anymore. He's still got it. I love it. I love his charm. The story of Mission Impossible is actually fairly complex, which I quite enjoyed. I, I think it would have benefited them um, to cut down the details and the, and the specifics of the story um, and just go out and do it. And just go out and do the action, which I think sounds weird because you have a 30-minute car chase scene. But there are times where you have that, that club scene where, where you have all the characters talking in this club and they're going on for 20, 30 minutes just about the AI that's trying to take over the world. And it gets, just gets too jumbled and complicated when you start thinking about it too hard. I, I felt that I followed it pretty nicely, but um, 
Maybe it's because I haven't seen Mission Impossible movies before, and I don't really know all the characters' names, but it just got a little too jumbled for me personally. And I also think that even though the action was quite incredible, there were times during the car chase scene where I wish they would have done something else. It's 30 minutes long. It's a long car chase scene. At least it felt that way. Um, I just got a little bit too much car. So the action could have been more diversified. They could have cut down on the talking. Uh, but no, it was actually an incredible film. You should go see it in a big theater. It's not in theaters anymore. You should have gone to see it in a big theater if you haven't. If you haven't seen it, go download it. Go buy it off uh, a streaming, streaming site. Go to Paramount Plus and go watch it. A lot of fun. All right. Let's talk about The Flash. Directed by Andy Muschietti. Distributed by Warner Pictures. Let's start out by talking about Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller has done a lot of bad things. And he is... They are a Flash. When The Flash was done filming, Ezra Miller had not done all these terrible things. It came out, all the videos and the allegations after they filmed The Flash. After they already paid the other thousands of people who worked on the film. I, I personally had no trouble watching the film, um, even though Ezra Miller did all those bad things because they did them after they filmed, the, after they shot the film. Now, if Ezra Miller were to come back as Flash and film an, another movie, I would never watch another Flash movie ever again. I would never watch another DC movie ever again. First of all, they will not invite Ezra Miller back. Ezra Miller is done playing Flash. They're not coming back. But if they did, I would never watch another Flash movie ever again. And I don't think it was right for Ezra Miller to take away the work of all these thousands of people. I'm going to watch The Flash. I'm going to watch the incredible movie that Andy Muschietti directed and all the hard work that all these thousands of people put into this movie. All right, let's talk about the movie. I thought the trailers looked spectacular. Trailers looked phenomenal. I was happy to report the film was even better. <laughs> um, I thought the first act when the, when the Batman and the Flash were fighting the villains, the bank robbers in Gotham, uh, so much fun. The CGI, I you know not a lot of people enjoyed the CGI in this movie, but I thought it really worked for DC. When I think of DC movies, I think of that type of CGI. It's, it's not as realistic as, say, a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, but it really placed the aesthetics that this movie was made on. The Flash is a very non-realistic character compared to a lot of the Marvel characters. It deserved to have this kind of wonky CGI. It looked really well to me. I don't know why a lot of people don't think it looked that well. I know the babies looked pretty odd, but other than that, the CGI was quite phenomenal, I thought. The idea to bring Michael Keaton back in the film, it completely fit in the story. And I really thought that the way Michael Keaton laid out the multiverse and had the explanation was something unique. And it's probably the best explanation of the multiverse I've ever heard in a movie. Andy Muschiette did a great job. I cannot wait to see what he does with Brave and the Bold coming up. James Gunn's cinematic universe coming up. It's going to be great. I really love The Flash. No, a lot of you do not. But it's a fantastic movie. It's an A- movie. Let's move on to the only movie that I gave an A to, a, lot of, a movie that a lot of you probably have never heard of. This one is called Bottoms. It was directed by Emma Sligman, who was produced or distributed by MGM. And uh, <laughs> this film fucking rules. It does. It, in every way imaginable. From the moment we're introduced to the characters, I instantly fell in love with with every personality and relationship, I desperately wanted to be friends with every single character in this movie. That's how true I felt that they were. It's an outrageously wild and entertaining time. And as the film progresses, you continue to ask yourself, where are they gonna go next? And you're never prepared for exactly where they're gonna go. So this movie, in case you don't know, is a satirical critique on um, high school. These two lesbians want to start a fight club to have sex with cheerleaders, which sounds outrageous. I thought it was a really great satirical critique of lesbians in high school. And you might ask yourself, well, Michael, how would you know you're not a lesbian? <laughs> you're a man, you're a straight man. I understand that. I've had multiple best friends who are lesbians who've told me about their experience in high school. Um, and also just like their mannerisms were very similar, which I thought was really fun. <laughs> It, it, it matched the experience with me hanging out with those best friends. Based on that, 
movies are experiential events, as I've said, and the way they connect with us elevate movies. This completely elevated my experience so much. The relationships were genuine, they were true, had a whole lot of fun. You should go see this. It's outrageously funny and wild. You'll never desperately go in this movie. It's great. Go watch it. That is going to wrap up my top 10 list of the summer of 2023 for films. Did you agree with me? What ones did you not agree with me with? Leave your comments in the in the comments below. I would love to hear what you think. Again, if something didn't work for you, but it worked for me, I, that's really too bad. I wish it worked for you. And if something did not work for me, it worked for you, then that's great. I'm happy that you enjoyed it. I think that everyone should have films and movies that they love to watch. So let me know what you want me to talk about next. Can't wait to hear from you the next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.